Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Long Yu Caves. A group of farmers in China's Zhejiang province received the surprise of a lifetime in 1992 when they drained several small ponds in their village and discovered some enormous caves. It turned out to be an ancient underground world that nobody knew existed. All signs point toward the caves being carved out on purpose by some ancient civilization. But the question is, who were they? So far, 36 grottos have been discovered, including five enormous caverns, in total covering 30,000 square meters. The curious thing is that none of them are connected. They were carved into solid siltstone, with pillars evenly distributed throughout to support the ceiling and walls. Every stone column and wall is uniformly decorated with chisel marks, creating parallel lines. The marks make everything look like a pattern which would have taken a very long time, especially in the dark. There are also stone carvings of animals like horses, fish, and birds. The structures collect rainwater runoff from ground level and are equipped with sophisticated drainage systems for managing excess water. Based on the sheer size of the caves, scientists estimate that it would have taken 1,000 people working day and night for six years to complete. It probably took much longer than that, but so far there is no evidence of tools or construction methods. The large scale of the caves and the architectural design and attention to detail indicate that they were made by a very advanced society. But ever since their discovery, archaeologists, scientists, and historians have been unable to determine who built the Long Yu Caves, why they were built, and what they were for. The only known historical record mentioning the caves is a 17th century poem, which doesn't really reveal much. Clay pots discovered on the cavern's floors were dated to sometime between 206 BC and 23 AD, suggesting that the caves are at least 2,000 years old. Perhaps the caves were tombs, storage facilities of some kind, barracks for soldiers, or perhaps it was used for some type of mining. Only one of these caves is open to tourists so far, and despite years of research, the civilization responsible remains unexplained. Aksumite Empire Considered one of the least documented civilizations of the ancient world, the Aksumite Empire was an African kingdom that spanned modern-day Eritrea and northern Ethiopia, as well as parts of Djibouti, Somalia, and Somaliland. It rose to power around 80 AD and lasted for many centuries, meeting its downfall in 825. The kingdom of Aksum was a major player along a commercial trade route between the Roman Empire and ancient India. It had its own currency for trading and participated in the politics of kingdoms across the Red Sea and the Arabian Peninsula. Aksum was the first sub-Saharan empire to mint its own coins and adopt Christianity, but researchers know very little else about it. Outside of Egypt and Sudan, it's the earliest complex society or major civilization in Africa, archaeologist Michael Harrower told The New Scientist. Aksum stopped producing coins in the early 7th century. Meanwhile, residents were forced inland for safety, where they sought refuge from some sort of upheaval on higher ground. The capital was abandoned and resettled at a yet unknown location. One theory suggests that the Aksum Empire became economically isolated as other civilizations dominated the Red Sea, naturally leading to its decline. On the other hand, legend holds that a Jewish queen named Yodit ordered the burning of Aksum's Christian churches around 960, but several modern historians doubt that she ever even existed. Another hypothesis suggests that a pagan queen named Bani al Hamwiya from a rivaling tribe ended Aksumite power. Climate change is also cited as a possible triggering factor for the kingdom of Aksum's collapse. During the first century, increased rains vastly improved the region's food supply and lengthened the annual growing season. But food production had to support a large population, and it's possible that the land simply could not endure the intensity of cultivation that the culture required, and that soil erosion ultimately led to the Aksumite Empire's downfall. In late 2019, archaeologists announced the discovery of Beta Samati, a lost Aksum city located between its capital, also named Aksum, and the Red Sea, thanks to locals tipping them off about the buried site, which sits over 10 feet below ground. Experts hope that the settlement will help them learn more about the enigmatic empire and its decline, which began during the mid-6th century. The Kukuteni Tripilians The Neolithic Kukuteni Tripilian culture, also known as the Tripoli culture, existed in what is now Eastern Europe, encompassing parts of modern-day Moldova, Ukraine, and Russia. It rose to prominence around 5,500 BC and lasted until 2,750 BC. 
the civilization's settlements were small and dense. Sometime between 4000 and 3500 BC, the Cucuteni Tripilia civilization built Neolithic Europe's largest settlements, with populations numbering between 20,000 and 46,000 people. Evidence shows that the culture had a habit of destroying its settlements every 60 to 80 years by burning them down, for reasons that scientists still don't understand. Oftentimes, they built new settlements on top of the burned down remains of past ones. For example, the Poduri site in Romania bears evidence of 13 habitation levels throughout its existence. The Cucuteni Tripilians also left behind no signs of a written language. Between this and the seemingly ritual burning of their cities, experts have very little to work with in terms of learning about the culture. The few clues left behind include clay totems, copper tools, and spiritual treasures. Rediscovered during the late 19th century, evidence of the civilization shows that Neolithic Eastern Europe played a bigger role in human advancement than it was previously credited for, but the lingering question of what and how it contributed remain. Ancestral Puebloans A group of Native Americans called the Anasazi, now referred to as the Ancestral Puebloans, once lived in an area of the U.S. that is famously known today as the Four Corners. Their network of hundreds of communities spanned across modern-day southeastern Utah, northeastern Arizona, northwestern New Mexico, and southwestern Colorado. The ancestral Puebloans possessed an advanced knowledge of the skies and incorporated the celestial sciences into their diverse architecture. They are best known for their famous cliff dwellings, which were primarily used for defensive purposes. Built between 900 and 1350 AD, these multi-story homes were incorporated into tall, steep mesas and canyon walls like large apartment complexes. Some of these structures can still be seen today in places like the Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico and Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. The ancestral Puebloans also built small pit houses out of earth and stone, as well as huge complexes of hundreds of rooms known as Great Houses. Additionally, they were well known for their pottery, which was generally gray in color. They are also well known for their kivas, a circular space used for ceremonial purposes. During the 12th and 13th centuries, they left their homes, and historians have not figured out why. Researchers believe that climate change, such as prolonged drought, topsoil erosion, deforestation, and other environmental factors may have triggered the decision to migrate elsewhere, but they can't say with certainty that this was the case. They can only speculate based on the available evidence. The Mycenaeans The Mycenaeans were immigrants who arrived in the Aegean region around 2000 BC. While their origins are a bit murky, they subsequently conquered the Minoans after living alongside them and trading with them for some time. The Minoans and the Mycenaeans were the first literate societies in Europe and greatly influenced the classical Greeks. The Mycenaeans took over the Minoan area and were more militaristic and austere than they were. They became the dominant civilization in the area, building palace fortresses and tombs, large walls and gates. They frequently terrorized and raided other societies like the Hittites and the Egyptians. Through their plundering, they became extremely wealthy, and the civilization flourished between 1600 and 1200 BC. There were over 100 centers spread throughout Greece and the Mediterranean, but historians still don't know how they were organized how they communicated, and what their relationship was between all of the different palaces and their populations. Then suddenly, the civilization began to decline. Around 1230 BC, people began leaving the region in droves. Some historians say that we may never know why the Mycenaeans disappeared. There are numerous theories, including the realistic possibility that the society's violence against others finally caught up with them. Natural disasters, possibly including an earthquake and or volcanic eruption, may have also caused their decline. By 1100 BC, most majestic sites had been reduced to villages, but their legacy remains. The Rapa Nui Hundreds of years ago, a small group of Polynesians left their homeland for unknown reasons and rowed their vessels through the Pacific Ocean. They eventually settled on a remote island known today as Easter Island located roughly 2,182 miles off the modern-day Chilean coast. Found uninhabited, this small 63-square-mile island boasted lush greenery and rolling hills. The settlers named it Rapa Nui. There, they built massive monolithic structures called Moai. Also known as the Easter Island Heads, some of these mysterious sculptures still stand today. The more archaeologists and researchers learn, the more intriguing Easter Island becomes. The immense stone figures are a testament to the society's artistry and engineering. 
Scientists can't seem to agree on exactly when the Rapa Nui people arrived on the island. It was previously believed that they came between 700 and 800 AD, but a radiocarbon analysis shows that they may have arrived as late as 1200. Others think that the Rapa Nui came to the island much sooner, perhaps as early as 300 AD. Some question how they were able to plot their course to get to the island in the first place. Researchers also struggle to understand why the civilization collapsed. Perhaps they ran out of food. It looks like at some point deforestation and agriculture caused palm trees and grass to dwindle, leaving behind eroded, nutrient-deprived soil that became practically impossible to cultivate. The island was practically barren by the time the Dutch arrived in 1722. One theory holds that the Rapa Nui civilization consisted of several tribes throughout the island, and that these factions began warring against one another when food became scarce and the threat of starvation loomed. Another hypothesis, based on findings indicating that the Rapa Nui may have arrived around 1200, suggests that the environmental destruction they suffered from happened extremely fast. Rat bones found at an ancient settlement site point toward the possibility that this invasive species contributed to the society's swift downfall. Archaeologist Terry Hunt does not believe that humans could have destroyed the island's forest so quickly on their own, and that the rodents fed on the once abundant plant life until there was practically nothing left. The San Xing Dui During the Bronze Age, a little-known culture called the San Xing Dui thrived in what is now China's Sichuan province. The only known site connected to the civilization turned up dozens of artifacts dating back to the 12th and 11th centuries BC, although evidence shows that a walled city existed at the site as far back as 1600 BC. Built along the banks of the Yazi River, the city and its walls were surrounded by large canals measuring between 66 and 82 feet wide and 6.6 .6 to 10 feet deep, which were used for navigation, defense, and flood control. Sangshuing Dui was divided into residential, industrial, and religious districts. A farmer discovered the first known evidence of the ancient culture in 1929, when he unearthed a cache of jade artifacts while digging a well. Many of the objects therefore ended up in the possession of private collectors. Meanwhile, Chinese archaeologists scoured the area for further evidence of the civilization, and finally hit the pay dirt in 1986, when they found sacrificial pits filled with bronze, jade, and pottery items. The items were broken and burned before being buried, indicating that they were ritually placed in the ground sometime between 3,000 and 5,000 years ago, when the culture mysteriously vanished from the site. Nobody really knows exactly who the Sangshuing Dui really were, despite the handful of evidence they left behind. They abandoned their settlement sometime between 2,800 and 3,000 years ago, and possibly moved to the nearby ancient city of Jinsha. Researchers aren't sure why they fled. One prevailing theory suggests that the ancient people encountered an earthquake or a landslide, which redirected the Minjiang River, cutting them off from their freshwater supply and forcing them to relocate elsewhere. The Etruscans The Etruscans left behind the first identifiable evidence of their civilization around 900 BC in what is now Tuscany in modern-day Italy, a region once called Eritrea. They are considered one of the most advanced societies to develop outside of ancient Greece, yet scientists know very little about their origins. The earliest known examples of Etruscan writing date back to around 700 BC. Today's scholars only partially understand the Etruscan language, as the culture's texts did not survive into modern times. For this reason, researchers rely heavily on later writings from Greek and Roman sources, which carry a disapproving bias against the Etruscans and do not necessarily reflect the culture accurately. For example, archaeological evidence suggests that they were indigenous to Eritrea, but the Greeks wrote that the Etruscans stemmed from the indigenous Pelasgian population of Greece, something which modern experts doubt heavily. Etruscologist Dominique Briquel argued that the Greeks made this assertion based on witnessing trade between the Etruscans and Pelasgians and similarities between some of the two societies' traditions that likely resulted from cultural exchange rather than migration. Additionally, Brickell claimed that the Greeks had political motivations for fabricating the Etruscans' history. The Etruscans began assimilating into Roman society sometime during the 4th century BC, following the Roman-Etruscan Wars. In 90 BC, they were granted Roman citizenship, and their territory was fully incorporated into the Roman Empire in 27 BC. Much of the Etruscan culture was likely lost throughout this transition, and even DNA studies have failed to definitely determine exactly where the civilization came from. 
The Bell Beaker Culture The Bell Beaker Culture arose around 2800 BC and is named for its inverted bell-shaped drinking vessels, which came into use at the very beginning of the European Bronze Age. These unique-looking cups became all the rage across Europe at the time, leading to a debate among modern experts. Whether the people who used the bell beakers were a single culture that migrated across Europe, or the vessels were used across various cultures. It's the pot versus people argument, which is one of the longest running questions in archaeology. The sheer variety of bell beaker artifacts makes it difficult to trace them to one singular culture or place of origin, leaving today's researchers to refer to the spread of these items simply as the bell beaker phenomenon. Scientists analyzed the genomes of 170 ancient Europeans and compared them to the genomes of other ancient people, as well as modern genomes. They found that skeletons discovered near bell beaker artifacts in modern-day Central Europe and Iberia shared few genetic ties, indicating that the culture did not consist of one group of migrating people. On the other hand, ancient remains from Britain point toward the bell beaker people being a genetically distinct group that almost entirely replaced the people who occupied the island before they arrived. This suggests that the beaker people invaded Britain and pushed out the previous population of Neolithic farmers, the ones who built Stonehenge. Today, British people have more DNA from the beaker people than Neolithic farmers and are barely related to the Neolithic people who built the monument 5,000 years ago. The findings are absolutely sort of mind-blowing, said archaeologist Barry Cunliffe, a professor emeritus at the University of Oxford. They are going to upset people, but that's part of the excitement of it. DNA analysis of 400 prehistoric skeletons, some from after Stonehenge and others born before it was created, demonstrate that the beakers replaced 90% of the people and had fair skin and lighter hair and eyes. They may have destroyed the people who built Stonehenge by bringing the bubonic plague with them to Britain. The spread of ideas and migration and the fact that so many beaker artifacts have been found throughout Europe make these people an enigma. Ancient Roman Sea Fortress Russian divers recently stumbled upon an ancient Roman sea fortress hidden beneath the waves. This was done thanks to Russian scientists from Sevastopol State University, who were diving off the coast of Syria when they came upon three ancient naval structures, a fully blown port, and a Roman sea fortress that had apparently never before been discovered. And to make things even more interesting, the discovery was made near the port city of Tartus, which the Crusaders had called Tortosa. This place has a long history of combat, trade, and culture. It's also one of the best-preserved Syrian-Palestinian medieval cities that is still around today. According to Dr. Tatarkov, who worked closely with the divers and archaeologists on the project, the sea fortress was constructed sometime in the 1st century AD. The divers found a lighthouse, four marble columns, and three sunken wharfs. There were even some ancient hydraulic structures, such as breakwaters and quay walls. When placing all these discoveries together, you have an entirely new section of the port city that must have been flooded sometime in the last 2,000 years. The team also recovered hundreds of tiny fragments of ancient Greek amphorae and Roman household artifacts made of stone, Phoenician pots, and Egyptian vases. While these might not seem as important as the whole entire site, they actually provide pieces to the ancient puzzle that can help archaeologists rebuild a map of the ancient trade routes that once went through this city. India's Lost City Divers in India recently discovered some very unexpected archaeological evidence underwater that could, if properly verified, rewrite the ancient history of the entire subcontinent and even the world. Marine archaeologists have used sonar scanning equipment to send beams of sound waves to the bottom of the sea, where they identified massive geometrical structures inside of a vast region about five miles long and two miles across. The researchers were actually performing a study about the Ice Age. These geometrical structures are thought to predate the oldest remains anywhere in India by over 5,000 years. This accidental discovery was revealed by Graham Hancock in his new documentary, in which he details that there is an ancient city hiding at a depth of 120 feet, just 25 miles from the shore. However, according to Mr. Hancock, this discovery has been swept under the rug because archaeologists in power are afraid that it could flip everything we know about the origins of civilization on its head. He says that man-made objects from these submerged cities have yielded carbon dates up to 9,500 years old. That's 5,000 years older than any city discovered by archaeologists anywhere. 
It means that we are dealing with a civilization lost at the end of the Ice Age, perhaps even one of those that the flood myths speak of, which flourished before history began. The city allegedly discovered off the coast of India is estimated to have been the size of Manhattan. A piece of wood was dated back to 9,500 years ago, so Hancock is saying that when Stonehenge was built, this mysterious lost city would already have been 5,000 years old. What this means is that we could be dealing with a civilization that was lost just at the end of the Ice Age, and this would suggest that human beings all over the world had actually been thriving in civilizations long before previously thought. But after some mysterious event, all traces of them were lost. However, experts argue that the artifacts from the site were brought up by dredging, which mixes everything together, instead of by a controlled archaeological excavation. Construction material, pottery, wall sections, sculptures, and human bones were all found, but dating them was quite difficult. The only confirmed date was from the small piece of wood, but that does not a civilization make. Good news is there was actually a large cache of archaeological remains, so it is just a matter of time before we discover the truth. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join us! The Kibatos Castle The Kibatos Castle is a Byzantine-era fortress sitting at the bottom of the Sea of Marmara in the northwest of Turkey. This ancient castle was first unearthed totally by accident in 2019, while archaeologists were doing underwater research in the area. They unexpectedly found the castle about 10 feet deep, totally submerged and mostly in ruins. Experts believe that the castle was probably submerged during an ancient earthquake, with a survey team currently searching for evidence to find out more about the castle and if it holds any interesting ancient secrets. As far as we know, the area in which the castle was found dates back to between the 4th and 12th centuries, being used by both the Byzantines and the Ottomans. There was also a pier and a lighthouse found near the castle, suggesting a catastrophic event destroyed a large section of the coastal town. The Kibatos castle was constructed during the rule of Emperor Alexius, and it even served as a bastion of defense when battling against the European crusaders. The castle has been mentioned in several historical chronicles and witnessed many important events in history. Efforts are now underway for it to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Ancient Underwater Cave when researchers Fred Davos and Sam Meacham from the Quintana Roo Aquifer System Research Center decided to do a bit of diving in the submerged cave La Mina, they became the first humans to enter this mysterious site in about 10,000 years. This long-forgotten cave is located underneath the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Down in the murky depths of the underwater cave, these researchers discovered hammers made from broken stalagmites, a ceiling covered in soot, and traces of ochre all of which have led them to believe the cave was used as a mine over 10,000 years ago. According to Brandy McDonald from the University of Missouri, archaeological evidence has suggested that human beings have been mining and utilizing ochre for hundreds of thousands of years. Humans use this pigment to make cave paintings and when practicing mortuary rituals. In fact, ochre is still used today in places like Namibia for things such as bug repellent, sunscreen, and for tanning animal hides. Ochre was used for quite a lot, which explains why the ancient people of Mexico put their lives in danger 10,000 years ago to extract it from this mine, which of course wasn't underwater back then. It's pretty amazing that these two men entered a place where humans hadn't stepped in thousands of years. The Maya would arrive thousands of years after the ochre mine was already abandoned, but they already knew that there was something special and important about these underwater caves. A tiny seahorse. In much cuter news, a new species of seahorse has unexpectedly been discovered off the coast of South Africa. This tiny little critter is about the size of your fingernail, and yet it is one of the most mystifying sea creatures recently found. It's only about two centimeters in length and is the first ever pygmy seahorse seen in the waters off the coast of the continent. And what makes it even cooler is that the research team concluded that this newest seahorse is distinctly different from the other seven known species, with its closest relative around 5,000 miles away. Did you know that almost all species of seahorse are under threat of extinction? Because of habitat destruction and bottom trawling, there are already several different species listed on the IUCN Red List of threatened species. There may already be species gone that we didn't even know about. Pygmy seahorses are so incredibly unique that scientists have not been able to learn much about them. And even though they found this newest species and documented it, the small pygmy seahorse is still a scientific mystery. Dragon Skeleton 
The skeleton of a dragon may have just been discovered underneath the deep blue. Unfortunately, this newest discovery is so vague and secretive that we don't even know where it was found. An internet sleuth was browsing Google Earth and shared that the bones of this legendary monster were apparently found off the coast of an unnamed island, with the bones being over twice the size of the island itself. There is what the user says is the shape of a mythical dragon underneath the crystal blue waters, and it looks significantly different from any sandbar or buried geological feature. You can see the horns at the top of the head, the extremely long neck, and what could be ribs and bone fragments. Could this be some sort of extinct dinosaur or marine reptile skeleton? The remnants of a leviathan sea monster? Or could it be some other kind of ferocious beast that was the size of a small island? While this would be awesome, other people claim that the person is just searching for shapes in the clouds and that the skeleton and horns are actually just a sandbar. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Ancient Preserved Forest Scientists have discovered a bizarre underwater forest that dates back 60,000 years and they think that the preserved trees within this forest could help engineer new medicines. The forest is built of cypress trees, and it's located just on the banks of a wide river near the Gulf of Mexico. It was just as humans began wandering out of Africa that the trees here became buried under sediment. The sea level rose, and the forest was submerged and buried. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reports that for 60,000 years, it remained completely undisturbed. Then, in 2004, Hurricane Ivan devastated the Gulf Coast. The seabed and the sediment that had kept the forest perfectly preserved were wiped away. A few years later, a team of scientists working from Northeastern University organized an expedition to go down there and bring back some pieces of the ancient lost wood. The operation was a huge success, and according to Brian Helmuth, who had participated in the dive, it was like diving into a vat of chocolate milk with almost zero visibility. Plus, the entire area was swarming with sharks. But it was all worth it when they got into the forest and found stumps of pristine wood just sticking out of the embankment. They managed to haul some giant chunks of wood back up to the surface, and they found about 300 different organisms inside of it, including a type of shipworm. After isolating some bacteria from the shipworm specimens, 12 bacteria are currently undergoing specialized DNA sequencing, with hopes that they will be able to contribute to new drug treatments for pain and anti-cancer medications. The Frozen Battlefield A new and unexpected breakthrough in archaeology has revealed a frozen battlefield, where 800 soldiers died while fighting on the Baltic Sea. The wreckage of the Swedish warship Mars was just found in pieces at the bottom of the ocean. This warship was made sometime between 1563 and 64, and at the time it was the biggest warship ever constructed. But then, in 1564, while participating in the Northern Seven Years' War, the vessel caught on fire and exploded. Richard Lundgren from Ocean Discovery recently told National Geographic that he was intrigued by the legend of Mars since he was a little boy. Besides its historical value, there was a rumor that the ship had gone down with a large treasure full of silver coins. There were many attempts to find the ship, but all of them failed. Finally, Lundgren and his team hit the jackpot. He said that descending down towards the Mars wreckage was like jumping into a time machine and going 450 years back in the past. Richard and his colleagues not only found the broken vessel, but also the legendary treasure worth an enormous amount of money. There are estimated to be at least 220,000 silver coins scattered throughout the wreckage, but there could be more for them to find. But the grisliest of all were the human remains. The researchers believe that the ship sank with 800 soldiers on board, making this one of the creepiest dive sites ever discovered. They said it was quite eerie because you can see a lot of bones down there strewn all across the wrecked ship. The water conditions and lack of oxygen have helped keep the skeletons preserved after all this time. Submerged 7,000-year-old site Stone tools scattered across the ocean floor off the coast of Australia have recently been dated back 7,000 years making the submerged site the first of its kind. Australia has a long history of humanity going back at least 65,000 years, but because of the way the Earth has changed throughout those years, many of the most important sites are now under the surface of the ocean. But that doesn't mean all is lost. 
This most recent discovery, which was outlined in the journal Plus One, reveals that many indigenous landscapes, artifacts, and maybe even settlements are still preserved just offshore. The research team went in practically blind, not really knowing what to expect, and they said we just figured if we could throw every bit of technology and a lot of smart people at the problem, after three years, we should come up with something. But why is so much of human history in Australia underwater? This is because 12,000 years ago, the glaciers melted and the sea level suddenly spiked, and a lot of Australia's habitable land was engulfed with water. The team used planes with lidar and sonar on boats to scan the area. The first few sites didn't show anything, really. But this area, known as Murujuga, also the Dampier Archipelago, has a wealth of archaeological sites. This dry and rocky region in northwestern Australia is already rich with over one million different examples of rock art and heaps of indigenous artifacts. But as the team found, there is even more just hidden off the shoreline. When the team took a look at another site, they were very happy to find some stone tools about 8 feet below the surface. Then, at another site, 45 feet below the surface, they found tools dating back 8,500 years. In total, the team found hundreds of stone artifacts. Most of these tools were used for scraping or cutting or even for hammering. These discoveries provide clues to how people crossed the sea to arrive to Australia and how they lived. It is also the first time that maritime sites have been found in the tropics that can be dated back over 5,000 years. A Forgotten Culture A team of Native American tribal citizens recently came upon a rather unexpected discovery, which could be proof that a culture from the Ice Age lived in the Great Lakes area 10,000 years ago. The discovery was made in the Straits of Mackinac when the group used a remotely operated underwater vehicle to take a look at some oil and gas pipelines stretching across the bottom of the lake. They also found stones arranged in a variety of patterns on the lake floor, suggesting that at one time, a culture had been using the lake as some kind of settlement, long before it was ever filled with water. According to Andrea Pierce, one of the locals involved in the mission, nobody had expected to find any sort of archaeological evidence of anything. But here's where things get controversial and crazy. Because the citizens were able to find the ancient formations and patterns so easily by themselves, they questioned who else knew they were there and allowed the pipeline to be installed through them, completely destroying the historic location. It's likely that somebody knew the relics of an ancient civilization were sitting at the bottom of the lake, but they put the pipeline through anyway because they didn't care. Now it's going to be very hard for archaeologists to do any kind of investigating, meaning that we may never know who built the monuments and why they were kept a secret. Strange Dark Streaks On February 18, 2021, NASA's Perseverance touched down safely on Mars, kicking off a new era of exploration. There are probably going to be many discoveries from the red planet, but for right now, scientists are pretty excited about evidence of what scientists believe to be landslides, which suggests that Mars was once a hospitable place for life. And it all comes down to dark streaks found on the planet's surface. In a new study published in the journal Science Advances, scientists claim that melting ice is combining with the salty permafrost underneath the ground on Mars, creating a chemical reaction that causes a sort of liquid slush to flow down the sides of mountains. This liquid slush is revealed in dark streaks across the Martian surface. And even though scientists say that the icy substance is far too salty to host life, that probably wasn't always the case. Janice Bishop, one of the head researchers at the SETI Institute, says that two to three billion years ago, Mars would have looked very different. All the evidence points to Mars being a habitable planet quite similar to Earth once upon a time. However, nobody has any idea what caused the possible habitable Mars to turn into such a harsh, cold, and miserable environment unsuitable for life. While Mars may look hot, it is about 50 million miles further from the Sun than Earth, so it gets much less light and heat. Thanks to these new dark streaks, scientists are saying that the environment beneath the actual surface of the planet was probably habitable for much longer than the surface itself. If these dark spots are truly created by saltwater and melting permafrost, there could be a much deeper mystery to solve under the surface of Mars. It might even still contain life. The Perseverance is on a mission to collect rock samples from the river delta and an ancient lake that might just have the answer. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Tasmanian Convicts and Japanese Samurais In 1889, a small group of Australian convicts turned into pirates when they hijacked a British ship in Tasmania named the Cyprus 
and then they fled to China. The captain of this crew was William Shallow, and he claimed that he sailed his hijacked ship all the way to ancient Japan. Throughout history, there have been no documents that proved his story, and so historians have generally disregarded it as just that, a story. But recently, an English teacher living in Japan named Nick Russell made the amazing discovery that the Tasmanian convicts really did have an unusual run-in with Japanese samurais. It all began with Nick's curiosity. He was living in the township of Mugi on Shikoku Island when he heard about the barbarian ship that had allegedly sailed into the bay back in 1830, only to be fired upon by samurai commanders. Nick went to the curator of the local archive and inspected the original samurai records from that year. What he discovered were detailed watercolor paintings of the Tasmanian ship and its crew, including a painted image of Captain William Swallow. But it wasn't that simple. The original samurai accounts were written in ancient Japanese, so Nick had to go through the painstaking process of translating it into modern Japanese. And that's when he was able to link a vague incident from Australia and a minor incident not very famous in Japan. The samurai had intercepted the hijacked boat, they refused to let any of the crew members on dry land, and they fired cannonballs at it until the boat sailed away. Later on, William Swallow was arrested, sent to London, and faced trials of piracy. COVID-19 Neanderthal Genes In 2020, researchers claimed to have discovered a Neanderthal gene that decreased a person's ability to fight the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And in 2021, this research was flipped on its head by a project in Japan that identified a different group of genes that some humans have inherited from Neanderthals, which assist the cells in our body to defeat invading viruses. These three genes can apparently reduce the risk of developing severe symptoms of COVID-19 by up to 22%. This research was done by scientists at the Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University in Okinawa. Researchers claim that the interbreeding between modern humans and ancient Neanderthals gave us the special COVID-19 resistant genes about 60,000 years ago. So you could have the good or bad COVID-19 Neanderthal genes. Scientists now believe that ancient Neanderthals developed these particular genes probably to fight ancient viruses, similar to COVID-19, and these genes have been passed on down throughout the ages. But unfortunately, not everyone has them. A study claimed that only about half of people living outside of Africa are in possession of the gene, and about 30% of the population of Japan still has it. Mysterious Chinese Burials Archaeologists in China have recently discovered thousands of never-before-seen burials on the side of a cliff. This burial ground was used for about a 2,000-year period, and many interesting historical artifacts have been uncovered so far. Experts are now saying that these cliffside graves could help to trace the evolution of burial customs in China and offer insights into the mysterious religious beliefs of the country two millennia ago. The tombs themselves were discovered in Chengdu by the Xuanqin Innovative Science and Technology Park during construction work in 2015. The tombs were found cut into the face at the top of a cliff, with most of the tombs built out of brick. Some were supported by wood to keep them from collapsing. About 6,000 burial spaces have been discovered here so far, all of them varying in size and shape. The first of the burial sites dates back to the Warring States period of around 475 BC, earlier than the unification of China under Emperor Qin Shi Huang in 221. Archaeologists unveiled ceramic figures of humans and animals, terracotta pottery, glass artifacts, coins, and even a Buddha statue. But work is still ongoing at this amazing new archaeological site, so it's likely that more revelations will be unveiled in the future. Ruins of White Island The ruins on White Island are pretty creepy. Between 1840 and the 1930s, White Island was a major mining source of sulfur and gypsum. And even though White Island was known to be a volatile volcano capable of causing mass destruction, people continued to mine for precious metals and important minerals even after a huge disaster struck in the year 1914. That year, part of the volcano's crater wall collapsed, triggering a landslide that sent mud and rock gushing into the lake below. All 11 sulfur miners on the island at the time were buried alive in the disaster. It was a tragic incident, with the only survivor being the camp cat named Peter the Great. Nobody even knows when it happened since the destruction wasn't noticed for days. But even after the tragic deaths of those 10 men, 
Mining went on for another 15 years, with operations being phased out between 1923 and 1933. Then, in 1936, the island was purchased by a private owner, and since then, the haunting remains and broken structures of the deadly White Island sulfur mine have been standing abandoned. White Island Tours searched for descendants of the victims in 2014 and had little luck. Only one known possible connection was found when a man came forward saying that he believes his wife is related to one of the deceased laborers. While only three of the men had children, it is certainly possible that other relatives are out there, but their identities remain unknown. The World's Oldest Color Scientists have just discovered what they believe is the oldest surviving biological color in the world. They found it underneath some ancient rocks buried in the Sahara Desert. The pigments date back 1.1 billion years, and they have a bright pink hue ranging from blood red to a deep purple in its concentrated form. The pigments are actually fossilized molecules of chlorophyll that Australian scientists say were originally produced by sea organisms. Researchers had to grind rocks into powder to extract the pigment, and according to Dr. Nurguanelli, the process was quite similar to how a coffee machine works. He discovered the pigments after running an organic solvent through the rocks that he had crushed into powder. And while you might think that this isn't that amazing, and that of course rocks will look pink when crushed in a blender, that is absolutely incorrect. This discovery is similar to finding a fossilized dinosaur with its original skin color still showing. These molecules discovered in the Sahara Desert are still molecules, and they are the oldest colored molecules in the world. When held up to the light, the molecules are neon pink. That means that the oldest color on our planet is neon pink. Unexplained Radio Beam Astronomers in 2020 identified a strange radio beam that they still haven't been able to explain. It is the most realistic candidate ever for an alien signal. Researchers working at the Breakthrough Listen project found the strange beam of radio light being sent to us from our nearest neighboring star system, Proxima Centauri. According to the report from New Science, the researchers who discovered the signal don't have any idea what it is. They are saying that it's the closest thing to an alien signal that humans have ever discovered, even more likely than the infamous WOW signal. If you're wondering how exactly they discovered this signal and what it is, it happened at the Parkes Observatory in Australia while the team examined data from a recent search for stellar flares coming from Proxima Centauri. What they found instead were strange signals that sounded a lot like extraterrestrial beacons. There appeared to be some sort of algorithm within the signals that researchers claimed could perhaps be from an intelligent technology, something like a satellite. There was an additional signal that went on for a full three hours and was concentrated in such a narrow range of wavelength that it almost seemed as if somebody sent a direct beam of information to our planet. Unfortunately, or fortunately, some of the researchers say that it could just be some sort of radio interference from technology on Earth rather than incidental contact with an alien civilization. But then again, we simply don't know. Nobody can decode this radio signal, and nobody has any idea what it means, and it came from 4.2 light years away, near a star that has at least two planets in orbit. So for now, the mystery continues. The Hand of Prell Archaeologists in Switzerland discovered a strange and baffling artifact inside of an ancient grave. A bronze hand that dates back 3,500 years is unlike anything ever found before anywhere in Europe. At this moment, researchers don't even know what they're dealing with. The hand could have been used as a symbol of power for religious purposes. Or maybe it was one of the first prosthetics in the world. Maybe it belonged to the world's first cyborg. Or it may have just been a decoration affixed to somebody's walking staff. The Archaeological Service of the Canton of Bern is analyzing the curious object, hoping they'll be able to answer everyone's questions. What they know so far is that the hand was made around 1500 BC, in the Middle Bronze Age of Europe. If the dating is accurate, it would make the hand the oldest bronze sculpture in all of Europe. Even the Archaeological Service admitted that there is nothing even close to the bronze hand. Even though they have excavated thousands of Bronze Age graves, Nothing even remotely similar has ever been found. That makes the hand unique, remarkable, and highly mysterious. Now known as the Hand of Prell, it was found near Lake Beale, along with a bronze dagger and a rib bone belonging to a human. A man was also discovered buried nearby in a damaged stone tomb. So far, researchers know almost nothing about this mysterious man, 
but they believe he was probably the owner of the bronze hand. The Giesboro Helmet The famous Giesboro Helmet was discovered in August of 1864 at a place called Barnaby Grange Farm. This place is located near what was once a small garrison of Roman troops stationed at the very edge of the Roman Empire. It was found by a construction crew folded up and buried deep in a bed of gravel. Made from a bronze and copper alloy, it was likely worn by an ancient Roman soldier from the 3rd century. Even though it was folded, it was found in strikingly good condition. It wasn't severely corroded and it didn't even have a scratch, just a dent where the workers had hit it with a pickaxe. It is decorated with the engravings of a trio of ancient Roman deities, Mars, Minerva, and Victory, with prancing horsemen and embossed flowers. The headgear would have also had fitted cheek pieces, which seem to have been lost. No other objects related to the helmet have been found nearby, and it was also buried pretty far from the nearest Roman garrison. So what was it doing there? One of the prevailing theories is that the helmet had been worn by a man who lived in Britain but had fought for the Roman military. It could be that he brought the helmet home with him after his service ended and then buried it in the middle of nowhere as a type of personal ritual. However, there is no proof that confirms this theory, and today the helmet remains one of the most valuable and mysterious artifacts ever uncovered in the United Kingdom. The Khmer Empire The Khmer Empire, also known as the Angkor Empire, occupied modern-day Cambodia between the 9th and 15th centuries. Its capital, Angkor, was the glory-bearing city and at the time was the largest city in the world. At its peak, the civilization ruled over a vast swath of Southeast Asia, including what are now Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos. The empire begins when the founder, Jayavarman II, possibly killed his uncle and took the throne, and later became a god-king under Hindu rites. The Khmer were among the first ancient civilizations to develop a road system, including bridges. They also built canals, hospitals, and defensive works like stone walls, which made them extremely good at preventing foreign invasions. The deeply religious Hindu-Buddhist society was extraordinarily wealthy and mostly self-sufficient, regularly seeing bountiful rice harvests. Satellite imagery shows that between the 11th and 13th century, Angkor was the pre-industrial world's largest urban center. Angkor Wat was part of Angkor and is one of the largest and most complex religious monuments ever constructed in history. The temple complex is now mostly taken over by nature, with large trees growing out of the buildings themselves. The Khmer Empire started to decline noticeably during the 14th century and by the 15th century the civilization dissolved. Historians are very confused as to why one of the most spectacular places in the world would be abandoned. Perhaps they were attacked by a rival empire. There is evidence the city was attacked and looted by the Sukhothai in the 1400s, or maybe there were internal power struggles, tense relations between elites and rulers, civil wars, plague, and a combination of factors that led to a slow decline. Historians are still trying to learn what exactly happened to this powerful empire. It was lost in the jungle for hundreds of years until it was rediscovered in the 1800s. The P-40 Kitty Hawk in 1942, Flight Sergeant Dennis Copping crashed his P-40 Kitty Hawk fighter plane into a remote part of the Sahara Desert. It was June 28th when the sergeant was flying his damaged fighter craft between two British airfields located in Egypt, but on his way, he experienced some kind of catastrophic failure and crashed. The fate of the pilot remained a mystery for 70 years, until the lost and forgotten fighter plane was finally discovered in the middle of some sand dunes. Archaeologists have referred to the recent discovery of the World War II wreckage as the aviation equivalent of Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt. The aircraft was almost perfectly preserved when it was found in 2012 by a Polish oil company worker while on a remote expedition in the desert, about 200 miles from the closest town. Because the craft was in such an isolated spot, nobody had touched it since its messy landing. The mystery remains as to what happened to the pilot. According to news reports, there was absolutely no sign of him. There had been a crude shelter made outside of the plane involving a parachute, but it appeared that the pilot must have run out of supplies and tried to walk to safety. As you can imagine, there is no way he was going to make it that far, especially since he didn't know where the closest town was. While his plane has been found, the pilot is believed to have died in the desert and covered by the wind and sand. A Lost Civilization 
A pair of researchers have found traces of a lost civilization in the Sahara Desert using remote sensing technology, satellite images, and drone flyovers. The lost culture of the Sahara is known as the Garamantes, and archaeologist David Mattingly believes that they started to build a network of cities and fortifications around the few remaining oases in the Libyan part of the Sahara Desert, sometime around 1000 BC, or about 3000 years ago. This civilization likely reached its peak at the beginning of the Common Era and then began to decline after 700 AD. Mattingly claims that they probably declined after running out of water. That'll do it. But even though this culture is long gone, some of their structures are still standing, albeit in pretty rough condition. The reason not a lot is known about this ancient culture is that not many archaeologists do field work in the hot and remote areas of the Libyan Sahara. This place is harsh and difficult to get to safely, which means that cultures like the Garamantes that thrived before the Islamic conquest of North Africa have all but been ignored. Countries with a lot of civil unrest aren't great for people to go exploring. This is where the remote sensing technology comes in handy. Mattingly and his team have been able to locate at least 158 major settlements and even the remnants of irrigation systems. Unfortunately, there are still no archaeologists working on excavating these sites in the field, but at least we know they are hiding in the desert, just waiting for the right time. Nabta Playa Nabta Playa is believed to be the first astronomical site on planet Earth. It was constructed in the Sahara Desert about 7,000 years ago, making it far older than Stonehenge. The huge stone circle was used by a surprisingly advanced culture to track the summer solstice and the annual monsoon season. This was the earliest calendar, the first use of astronomy by a civilization, and perhaps even the starting point for what would eventually sweep around the globe and cause ancient societies everywhere to begin building their own stone monoliths to track the sun and stars. Nabta Playa is located roughly 700 miles from the Great Pyramid of Giza. According to Discover magazine, the astrological calendar was probably built by a cult of nomadic people who worshipped cattle. J. McKim Malville from the University of Colorado says that Nabta Playa is the first attempt ever made by human beings to make a legitimate connection with the heavens. The only sad part is that today we don't know what these ancient people were thinking when they developed astronomy and astrology. We don't know if they thought the stars and stones were connected, if they imagined the twinkling stars in the sky to be gods, or if they just wanted a reasonable way to track the seasons. While the site of Nabta Playa was discovered in the 70s, it wasn't until more recent decades that the full meaning and importance of this place was understood and shared with the world. Giant Sea Creatures New archaeological research has revealed that some of the largest and scariest sea creatures ever to populate the planet once thrived in what is today the Sahara Desert. Scientists have been examining fossil records for decades to try and figure out what kinds of animals lived in the ancient Trans-Saharan Seaway from between 100 million and 50 million years ago. Researchers now know that the water here was warm and relatively shallow, and also that it was apparently home to sea snakes that were over 40 feet in length and other horrifying monsters. Fossil records have revealed catfish over double the size of their modern cousins, as well as crocodilians with huge snouts and fish that were so strong that they could crush mollusks. You're probably thinking that animals back then were always gigantic, but the sea monsters living in the Trans-Saharan Seaway were extraordinarily large, even compared to other animals from the same era. Maureen O'Leary from Stony Brook University says that the seaway changed so frequently in size and geography that it created a sort of island situation, where the sea monsters living there grew to preposterous sizes because of a lack of predators. But in any case, now these beasts are long gone. Nothing remains except their bones buried in the sand. An ancient mega lake. The Sahara Desert may be a barren wasteland today, but new geological evidence has revealed that there was once a giant lake in the eastern Sahara 250,000 years ago. This happened when the Nile River flowed through a channel and completely flooded an area of over 42,000 square miles. Evidence of this ancient mega lake was spotted by Ted Maxwell from the National Air and Space Museum while studying radar data of the Egyptian Sahara. As a professional geologist, Maxwell was able to understand the patterns of wind-blown sediments and changes in the bedrock. By piecing all these different clues together, Maxwell realized that buried beneath the shifting sands is evidence of a huge body of water, and there may even still be buried channels 50 feet beneath the surface of the desert. 
Even more amazing is that scientists were able to use fossil fish found about 250 miles from the Nile River and 810 feet above sea level to determine where the shoreline of this ancient mega lake would have been. They looked at the locations of Paleolithic human settlements and they all corresponded to where the edges of the lake used to be. There is really no denying that the Sahara was once a prosperous lakeside destination. There was water, there was lush vegetation, everything you could want. And this may have been what coaxed early human beings into the area, where they eventually founded the great early civilizations. Mysterious Impact Crater A mysterious impact crater was found in the Sahara Desert, and scientists are linking it to a gemstone found in the tomb of the Egyptian king Tutankhamun. An international team of researchers analyzed satellite images of the vast and sandy terrain between two remote Egyptian villages in the desert. What they found was El Bar Crater, a massive hole about 1,000 feet across. It looks exactly like the impact crater made by a meteor. Scientists also found traces of chemicals that confirmed there had been a high-energy impact event at the site. This was done by inspecting the concentration of certain minerals in the rocks at and near the site of the crater. The rocks inside of the crater had been melted from something hitting them extremely hard. In other words, the crater was 100% formed by a meteor impact. But here's where the impact crater ties in with King Tut. Back when British archaeologist Howard Carter entered the young king's tomb in 1922, he discovered a breastplate encrusted with precious jewels and one extremely rare gemstone. It turned out that this rare gemstone was made of Libyan desert glass, a substance made almost entirely of silicon dioxide. It's one of the rarest minerals on the entire planet and is found only in the most desolate areas of the Sahara Desert. But for decades, scientists have not been able to figure out where the Libyan desert glass came from. Now it seems that the rare gem may have been created when a meteorite exploded over the Sahara Desert and caused a unique chemical reaction. This would mean that the Egyptian king was walking around with a gemstone in his breastplate brought to him from outer space. You know how intense the Egyptians were with their symbolism, so if that doesn't have powerful significance, I don't know what does. Stone Age Graveyard The largest Stone Age graveyard ever found in the vast nothingness of the Sahara Desert is providing an incredible record of life from a time when the region was a green paradise. This graveyard has just been discovered in the country of Niger by Paul Sereno from National Geographic. His team went on an expedition to find dinosaur bones and instead found a Stone Age archaeological site dating back 10,000 years. The site has been dubbed Gobero, and it is bursting with skeletons of both humans and animals. It's located inside the Tenere Desert, known as a desert within a desert, for its extreme remoteness. The graveyard has so far revealed two human populations living one after the other within a space of about 1,000 years. The skeletons included full sets of teeth, and small hands reaching out through the desert sand with finger bones still intact, and none of this had ever before been seen by modern human eyes. There were also artifacts like harpoon points and stone tools. These civilizations lived in the Sahara Desert when it was green and filled with animal life. The first group were hunters who colonized the Sahara between 10,000 and 8,000 years ago and were amazingly tall at an average of over 6 feet. The newer group was there between 7,000 and 4,500 years ago and had a more diverse economy of hunting and cattle herding. These later people were often buried with impressive jewelry, including bracelets carved from hippo tusks. It's not exactly clear what drove both groups out of the area, but it likely had something to do with the shifting climate as the Sahara Desert turned from a peaceful paradise into a violent wasteland. Ancient Rivers Three ancient rivers once linked Sub-Saharan Africa to the Mediterranean Sea. This was about 130,000 years ago, when three enormous rivers flowed across much of North Africa, providing a safe route of travel for ancient humans through what is today a merciless desert. The rivers were discovered after scientists simulated ancient rainfall patterns using newly advanced computer climate models. They were able to recreate what the desert looked like over 100,000 years ago, and this led them to the discovery of the rivers. But what's really cool is that the rivers are still there today, just buried under dozens of feet of sand. Scientists say that the most popular of the three ancient Saharan rivers was once called the Irarhar. This river system seems to have been a very popular travel route, and archaeologists have found artifacts from the Stone Age along much of what was once the Irarhar river system. 
The river would have provided green corridors where animals and plants could survive as well as massive lagoons and wetlands. Further surveys will probably reveal even more evidence of human activity dating back tens of thousands of years. The only issue is convincing archaeologists to get out there and dig through all that sand. Who's up for the challenge? The Whale Graveyard Buried beneath the Sahara Desert are thousands of whale bones. These whales date back 50 million years, when the Earth looked completely different. The highest concentration of whale bones has been found in a place called Wadi al-Hitan, or the Valley of the Whales in English. The bones found here belong to ancestors of modern whales, with the first ones being discovered way back in 1902. These fascinating beasts roamed the ocean that once covered all of the Sahara Desert. This was known as the Tethys Sea, and it filled the space between Africa and Asia before the Himalayas had even been born. Just imagine! Before the biggest mountains on Earth were even pushed out of the ground, enormous whales had already evolved from land creatures with legs and were swimming through the ocean in an area that is today nothing but an inhospitable wasteland. The Valley of the Whales provides a complete glimpse into the past, with the bones of extinct ancient whales spanning many millions of years. The Archaeoceti whale skeletons belong to the earliest form of cetaceans to emerge from the murky evolutionary past. These whales still have their legs and toes intact. Other whales have hip bones that were later lost. Their hip bones had previously been used for legs that carried them scuttling across the ground. For whatever reason, they returned to the water and over the course of millions of years, their legs became unnecessary in the water and they lost them. The whale graveyard shows us a clear picture of the progression of time and explains why some of the whale fossils still had remnants of their old limbs. Other fossilized sharks, fish, and plants found in the area have helped paint a picture of what the Tethys Sea would have been like. The Legendary Spinosaurus By far the coolest and most amazing dinosaur fossil ever found hidden in the Sahara Desert was that of the Spinosaurus. Paleontologists working in the Moroccan part of the Sahara unearthed one of the biggest and most intact Spinosaurus fossils ever, the Spinosaurus aegyptiacus. This legendary monster was the first known aquatic dino. It was a 50-foot-long predator with a massive sail on its back, huge teeth for ripping apart prey, and stubby little arms like a T-Rex. The Spinosaurus hunted in the ancient river systems about 100 million years ago. According to Nizar Ibrahim, an explorer with National Geographic and a paleontologist with the University of Detroit Mercy, the tail of the Spinosaurus is utterly bizarre and worked as a propulsive organ to move the large animal through the water. It even had a snout like a crocodile that it could use to catch fish. And even though the Spinosaurus could easily swim through the water, it also roamed the land. The amazing fossil was discovered buried under 15 tons of rock. The team of paleontologists labored in 120 degree heat, they were beaten by sandstorms, some of them were attacked by snakes, and it proved to be an entire adventure just to get the enormous bones out from under the rocks. But it was worth it as the skeleton of this monster proved that the Sahara Desert was once home to the world's first river dragon, the Spinosaurus. Would you go fossil hunting in the Sahara? Let me know in the comments below! Thanks for watching! Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon! Bye!